So, how is everybody? Inspired? You know, when I uh, studied development in China, I learned to look at nations almost the way a physician looks at patients. And when my bright peers asked me about Afghanistan and its development potential, I told them, forget about it. This is a patient struck by malaria, cancer, tuberculosis, and all simultaneously. The patient is comatose, and there is little to no chance that it will recover anytime soon. Now that I've spent time here, I realize that I've been wrong, utterly wrong. Afghanistan does have great development potential. And most of what I will share here today goes for all developing nations in the world. Every nation has great development potential. Yet, undeniably, Afghanistan is at a very critical juncture. And in my opinion, it's foremost a very critical socio-economic juncture. However, there's also very good news. Because this juncture coincides with an amazing opportunity. There's this very unique moment, this convergence of external support, the international community's attention, and internal advantages. And I'll come back to these advantages a little later on. But how do we embrace this opportunity? Well, I think something is missing here in Afghanistan, and it has to do with values. I'd like to borrow a little here from Lee Kuan Yew. He's Singapore's father, current minister, mentor, and one of the world's most efficient poverty alleviators. You know what he answered when he was asked what the key has been to Singapore's incredible achievements? Discipline. He didn't give any complex theories, long stories. He just used that one word, discipline. Singapore and Afghanistan find each other on the opposite ends of the development spectrum. Pretty much any development indicator you take, human development index, Gini coefficient, GDP per capita, Singapore ranks in the global top 10, and Afghanistan in the bottom 10. Yet, rather than try and explain why we are at the bottom, I have a vision for Afghanistan to escape the bottom. And for this vision, you know, in a very cool way, just like Lee Kuan Yew, I would like to use one word, one answer, one value, but I think Afghanistan situation is a little bit more complex than Singapore. And I think there's two key values that we miss here. Discipline and pragmatism. I sincerely believe that if we can start a culture of discipline and pragmatism, if we can nurture these values at a top level, leadership, government, and at the bottom, grassroots civil society, the Afghan patient can recover and can reclaim an honorable seat in the community of nations. Now, how do we get there? Let's rewind the tape some roughly 12 years. Some 12 years ago, we had our history's darkest chapter. We became infamous to the world for destruction rather than construction. Since the international community has provided this Afghan patient very ill back then with a bed, IV, crutches. But after some 12 years, we're still in bed still can't walk independently. 
perhaps the bed that they have given is a little too comfortable. Prefer to stay in bed. I don't think so. But what is sure, though, is that we cannot stay in bed and continue to burden the international community for our inability to stand up, walk. We can't continue to burden the international community's taxpayers for our inability. And in the age of globalization, staying in bed is a major liability. See, there's one thing we have to understand about globalization. Globalization is an irreversible process. What do I mean with that? Well, the technologies that made globalization possible, they can't just be uninvented. The connected world is not going to become disconnected. That means that nations will need to learn how to adapt, just like people, like individuals do when they change environment. Nations need to learn how to reinvent themselves. Afghanistan will need to learn how to adapt. Now, part of this adaptation process has already started, thanks to the international community, the Afghan government, and the Afghan people. But so far, these years of exhausting conflict, economic stasis, they've had to allocate most of their resources to combating extremism, insurgency, making sure that there's physical security. But in the process, they've somewhat neglected a vital component of psychological security of the population. Employment, wealth creation, a sustainable economy. But Afghans don't need to walk around unemployed, empty pockets, empty stomachs. Because the country, like I said, has major advantages. Well, what are some of these major advantages? Well, we have liberal democratic institutions. We have the international community's undivided attention and support. We have free media, a luxury that civil societies in so many other nations can only dream of. We literally sit here on top of some one trillion US dollars worth of natural resources, of mineral wealth. We have the good fortune of having two manufacturing giants, China and India as neighbors, who are interested in these resources, who want to invest in it. We have extremely nutrient-rich soil for great agricultural output. Our geographic setting, connecting Central with South Asia, and we have a use ratio of some 50%, meaning that some 50% of the population is aged 0 to 14. They can provide the brain and the muscle for the development of Afghanistan. Now, how do we embrace this opportunity in the context of Afghanistan? Well, by virtue of discipline and pragmatism, and when it comes to leadership, I think, in particular, pragmatism applies. My opinion, particularly, economic pragmatism. And discipline, above all, to society, social discipline. Leadership can't expect here from the international community, from civil society, to reconstruct the country. But civil society can't expect government to solve each single problem. Development is a joint effort. Now, let me start with leadership. At the end of the day, when all is said and done, it is a nation's leadership and its leadership's pragmatism and vision that determines the course of that nation. It's the government's task to take firm decisions so that there can be stability, predictability, security in the lives of people. It is also government's art, almost moral obligation to utilize to the fullest potential a nation's limited resources. And if it does this right, 
through a clean, efficient administration, it creates an ecology that educates, empowers civil society, that empowers men and women, so that they can, in their turn, contribute to development through entrepreneurship, through social creativity. I hear a lot of voices complaining, left and right, well, Afghanistan is doomed, Afghanistan suffers from this tyranny of geography, Afghanistan is rugged, Afghanistan is landlocked. Well, guess what? Kazakhstan's landlocked, Mongolia's landlocked. Kazakhstan in five years from now, 2018, will be one of Asia's richest countries in terms of GDP per capita. It's mainly been the product of their leadership, the pragmatism, the economic pragmatism of their leadership, and also a, a very rich natural resources endowment, just like Afghanistan. Mongolia, sandwiched between two giants, Russia, China, has seen its economy grow at an average rate of 8.7% in the last eight years. Both of these nations' human development index has grown, has structurally ranked better the last five years. What have these nations been doing? Well, they very cleverly identified their advantages and very pragmatically in selling their natural resources and investing that money in downstream industries, physical infrastructure, roads, power plants, dams, social infrastructure, hospitals, schools, employment, civil society. They didn't complain about geography. They said, we don't care how we alleviate poverty as long as we alleviate it. Let's look at China. China has alleviated some 650 million people out of poverty in the last roughly 35 years. Unprecedented in human history. Mainly the product of their united, pragmatic leadership. But it's also the product of their social discipline. The Chinese, hardworking, not complaining, collaborating. China didn't ask the world to adapt to herself, but rather adapted to the context, to globalization. That is the true power of a culture. When you have the ability to reinvent yourself, to be pragmatic, to adapt. I talked about leadership. Well, there's also the issue of social discipline. What we have to realize here in Afghanistan, what the Afghan electorate has to realize is that we can't just take democracy for granted. We have to work for it, we have to work for it hard to sustain it, to maintain it, to keep it. If we lose it, it's not going to come back for a very long time. Democracy took decades, in some cases even centuries, to develop in other nations. We have a unique opportunity in this region to make democracy work. That means that the Afghan electorate has to be more involved, more engaged, better informed, more vigilant. Otherwise, how are we going to exert any influence on government through public opinion? We can't just wait passively at the sidelines. And it's also a matter of pragmatism for Afghan civil society. I had a cab ride the other day, young man overcharged me. But I asked him, I said, so how about, how if the new administration creates you a job in, let's say a mine 40 kilometers out of town, would you take it? So he looks at me and he says, well, absolutely. I said, but you have to realize working in a mine is dangerous, it's dirty work. He says, well, I don't care. Pays better than what I do now, I'll take it. I have children to feed. Well, that is the pragmatism we need. People of Afghanistan, if we fail to embrace this opportunity, 
if we squander it, I'm afraid it's not going to come back for a very long time, for many generations. And if we fail to do so, and if our new administration fails to, over the next few years, create a substantial middle income class here, if it fails to, on an inclusive basis, get this economic engine of, us, of ours running, make sure that wealth is invested, is redistributed. I'm afraid that Afghanistan will remain mired in these current tribal and ethnic loyalties. And chaos will return. And I doubt that the international community will lend us a hand again. The time has come for us to embrace the opportunity. The time has come for us to leave the bed. The time has come for us to start nurturing these values of discipline and pragmatism. If we play this right, our children will live in a more stable and a more prosperous Afghanistan than our generation. We owe it to them, we owe it to ourselves, and we owe this to the international community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.